On this November 9th, 2023, the regular edition of What the Ship is being preempted, and instead we're bringing you What the Box. Hi, I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to today's episode. So we're changing things up quite a bit. Uh, normally what we do on What the Ship is cover five top stories across the maritime dimension, talk about news that is important and relevant to you, either the shipper, the carrier, the consumer, or just somebody interested in maritime shipping. Well, there's so much going on with containers right now, I figured we'll do a special episode on just containers. So we're dropping What the Ship and welcome to What the Box. That's right, What the Box. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so be alerted about new stories as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and jump into our stories about containerization. So our first story is this. U.S. container imports continue to rise, outpacing pre-pandemic levels. This is from Mike Schuller over at G-Captain. And this data is coming out of a group called Decar Systems uh, Group. And they're looking at container levels coming in for the month of October of 2023 and what they're showing is a four percent increase or rise since september reaching 2.3 million teus or 20 foot equivalent units so we move containers in modules uh, boxes and they're really large largely two types there's the 20 foot box a teu and then the 40 foot box the feu Two TEUs equal one FEU, and there's some weird size ones too. They're 45 footers, some extended ones, but this is how you measure containers on a ship. And so therefore what we're seeing is a jump, and this is a significant jump. Matter of fact, if you look at the chart provided with this story, you'll see what I'm talking about. So this is the Descartes chart, and a couple of things to notice here is that roughly since February, we have been on an uphill trajectory, a little dip here in June, but basically the amount of container imports coming into the U.S. is increasing. And there's a couple of reasons for that I'm going to talk about here in a minute, but let's talk about the history for a second here. So if you look at this chart, it goes back five years, back to 2019, the blue line here. And one of the things you tend to see is right about the midsummer, early fall season, you see it start to drop off. And that is a historical trend. You look at 2019, you see it. If you look at 2020, where it kind of fell quite a bit, but then all of a sudden really began this, this massive rise. And again, that was due to COVID. Because understand what happened with COVID. You may remember the great COVID disaster that was the shortage of toilet paper. Well, understand, there was not a shortage of toilet paper. There was a change in how you consume toilet paper. Now, I know that sounds ridiculous, but I'm going to tell you that we consume toilet paper differently during COVID. And no, it's not because COVID made us pee and poo more. That's not the reason. The reason was most people were at home. So for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they were using toilet paper in their home. Normally, you're out for at least eight hours a day, if not more so. And there you'll use toilet paper at your work, your business, out at you know restaurants, out at sporting events. Basically, you are peeing and pooing outside your house. Well, now you're 100% of the time, 24-7, 365 days a year at home. And that meant the supply of residential toilet paper, because let's be clear, we treat our butts much more nicely at home than we do out on the road. I mean, we get that nice two-ply. I mean, because if you're going to spend money, you're going to spend it on your ass. And so we wound up having to buy more of that. However, that did not stop the shipment of toilet paper for commercial use. And again, nobody knew how long the lockdowns were going to be. And toilet paper is a microcosm for the supply chain situation. And that's why you see the supply chain, the number of TEUs climb to record levels in 2020 and stay at record levels in 21 and 22, because we were consuming for both the home environment, where we thought we were going to be 365 days a, a, a year, and for the commercial environment, because we kept expecting to return back to it. And now we're trying to right size that. And now what we're seeing here is a strange thing because usually from September to October, one of the things we get ready for to see is a drop. We get ready to see a drop. Notice from August to September, in all four previous years is a drop. We didn't see that this year. We saw it actually increase. And there's a couple of reasons for that, I would argue. Number one, container shipping rates are really low. And so you don't have to share containers uh, during COVID because of the high freight rates to move goods, there were a lot of freight forwarders that were consolidating loads in the containers. 
you don't have to do that now. You can basically put one pallet in a container and ship it. Nobody cares because there's space and there is the freight rates to do it. So we're shipping more containers. So I'm a little worried about the volume measurement here being off. The real question is going to be going from October to November, because if you look at the past four years, they drop. And especially in 2022, where a very precipitous drop happened. And matter of fact, if you go to the next story, the National Retail F Federation is talking that. It says U.S. container imports are starting to wind down. In Inbound cargo volume at the nation's major container ports is expected to slow during the remainder of 2023 after surpassing 2 million TEUs, 20-foot equivalent units, for the first time in September. The NRF says the slowdown comes as mostly imported holiday season merchandise has already arrived ahead of what is expected to be a record holiday shopping season in the U.S., the world's largest retail trade organization is forecasting record holiday sales and a growth between 3 and 4%. Listen, we are in the midst of an economic downturn. We know this. Everybody sees it. You go to the grocery store. Things are worth more. Everything's more expensive. And when things are more expensive, you're going to buy cheaper goods. And unfortunately, most cheaper goods come from overseas. And that's one of the reasons why you're seeing this rise. If you come down here on this story, you'll see this chart here. It shows TEU millions in imports. And you look, in 2020, we imported 22 million containers. And if you go back from there, it's a pretty steady rise from about 2010 all the way up to 2018, fairly steady rise, plateaus off here in 2019 into 2020, and then again, go to the toilet paper crisis. It all of a sudden surges up to 25.8, 25.5 million, and now it's back down. And if you just remove 2021, 2022, and you look at this line here, it's a gradual increase. Nowhere near as, as big a climb as you saw from 2010 to 2018, or as steep of a climb you saw from 2004 to 2007. This is the 2008-9 economic crisis. So we're seeing a gradual rise here. We're seeing it go. You have to get rid of that big kind of COVID toilet paper bump. But what we're seeing is a gradual rise. And the question is going to be those numbers next month to see. At the same time, we have other issues down. So we have container imports up. We're winding down our containers. But then we have issues about where the cargo is going. This story over at G-Captain by Bloomberg deals with tankers, even though we're talking about containers. This story is extremely important. LPG tanker pays record $4 million for a Panama Canal slot. So there's about, usually on average, and we'll talk about this in a second, about 36 ships go through the Panama Canal daily, uh, about 20 of them through the old locks and about 10, 12 through the new locks. Container ships sail on a liner service. They have a scheduled service, kind of like an airline or a train. You know, they go, they fly set routes, they fly this route on a certain day, a certain time, and they go. Whether they're full or, or empty, they're going to go. And that means that particularly for container ships, they can book passage through the Panama Canal. They can basically make their bookings way in advance. This is how, how cruise lines go through the Panama Canal because they don't just show up at the Panama Canal and wait to go in. They, they have already booked this way in advance. Tankers and bulk carriers don't do that because they don't travel line routes. They're kind of what's called spot chartering. They'll go get a load and figure out where it's going to go and then head there. They're, they're kind of like the Uber taxis of shipping. Uh, containers are the bus lines, the, the, the airways, the trains, whereas the tankers are the Ubers. And so every, every day, the Panama Canal will raffle off, literally raffle off one spot. And one of the things we're seeing right now is companies are paying a huge amount of money to get that spot. This is an LPG tanker that was empty heading northbound from the Pacific to the Atlantic. And the reason they did this and, and the reason ships are not diverting around South America, because number one, that's ridiculous. It's 8,000 miles. It's really dangerous to go through the Drake Passage. If anyone's never been through the Drake Passage, you would never wantingly want to sail through the Drake Passage for any prolonged period of time. Uh, they won't do this because carrying cargo is when you make money. When you're empty, you're losing money. And so they don't want to wait and save money going around the Panama Canal. They want to get through the canal, load, and get on to their next service. 
Uh, if you're ever interested, the cheapest toll, usually it costs about, right now, about $900,000 to pay for a Panama Canal toll. The LPG tanker just paid $4 million. The cheapest toll in history was a dude that swam the canal. Uh, this is uh, Richard Halliburton. He swam it in, uh, was it 1928, 14 years after the canal opened. He paid a whopping 36 cents to go through the canal because uh, you, have, you have to pay for displacement through the canal. And he displaced 36 cents worth of water. I don't think the canal would do this now because of the water sh shortage. And that's the big issue with the, with the canal right now is this water shortage. We're seeing rain right now in the Panama Canal, which is great. Uh, uh, several rain. The lake levels have gone up. We're looking at about 80 Point four feet in the canal on Gatun Lake and understand the Panama Canal is a freshwater canal. The lake that's above sea level spills into the locks to fill it up. You cannot take seawater and put them into the locks. Number one, there's not pumps to do that. Secondly, that freshwater lake provides all the fresh water for the agriculture and for drinking water in Panama. So you can't just dump seawater into it. The new locks have a reclamation system. They rec uh, reclaim about 60% of the water from the new locks. The new locks are the ones that use the vast majority of the water usage. About 25% uh, of the water usage comes from just the new lane of the Panama Canal, the 2016 lane that's much bigger. The old locks do about 25% too. So about 50% of all the water usage out of Gatun Lake comes through the Panama Canal. You'll see right here, they're predicting water levels up to about 81, almost just short of 82 feet by December, but you're seeing draft restrictions, particularly in the Neo Panamax lane of 44 feet. You can usually get down to 48 feet. Uh, some, some numbers you'll see say 50. No ship with 50 feet has gone through the Panama Canal. That's literally almost touching bottom. But the problem is even if you get to, let's just say 82 feet, in December, if you look at the historic levels, and we'll come down here to this bottom chart, at the lowest levels, which are typically in May, on average, you're at 83 feet. December, you're usually at 87 feet. So the fear here isn't what's happening right now. It's that we're going to be on the downside here coming into the new year with less rain, and the lake levels may get critically low. And the response from the Panama Canal Authority is they have to start adjusting transits. This is a story from Greg Miller over at Freight Waves. I showed it the other day in a video on the Panama Canal. Average Panama Canal transits per day in 2022 to 2023. The red are the ships going through the big locks. The blue are those ships going through the older locks. And the ships that use the new locks come down to this. Uh, container ships, about four or five a day. Uh, dry bulk, about one a day. LPG carriers, about two a day. Uh, you see crude product carriers and LNG carriers, they're about a one a day. And so containers are the ones that use it along with LPG and LNG carriers the most. And the container ships are really important because those container ships that use that new lock system are the big Neo Panamax vessels. These are the ones that have been built prior to this, but we're building a lot more of them now. They're designed to be able to go through that new lane. Prior to the opening of the Panama Canal's new locks in 2016, the biggest container ship that can go through was about 4,500 TEU. Today, you can get up to 16,000 TEUs through that. And one of the things we saw as a result of the supply chain crisis, the big backlog of ships off LA and Long Beach, is a lot of ocean carriers want to shift their cargo, go through the Panama Canal, and deliver directly to the Gulf and East Coast of the United States. However, because of the drop in water in the Panama Canal, what we're about to see here is a reduction in the number of ships. Right now, you're sitting at roughly... Uh, as of this date, about 24 ships going through the canal. We're about November 8th at this point. So we've seen reductions in the canal down to this level, but they're talking about going down to 18 ships by the early part of the year. That means half the vessels going through the Neo Panamax lanes are going to be cut. That means, you know, whereas you had four or five container ships going through, now you may have two or three going through. And that is going to mean that containers are going to have to go a different route. They're either going to have to go on smaller container ships through the older locks. But again, the older locks are also seeing a reduction. They're going to have to be offloaded on the Panama side of, of the canal, excuse me, on the Pacific side of the canal, and railed overland to the other side and pick up another ship. Or they're going to have to go into the west coast of the United States. 
This is a chart from John McCowan over at Blue Capital's latest report out on containers. And one of the things you see here is since 2017, there has been a steady kind of linear decrease in the percentage of containers going into the West Coast. Once they open that canal, that new canal, you see that kind of decreasing. Plus, LA and Long Beach has a lot of problems associated with it. We saw the uh, potential for a strike, the labor renegotiation, we saw the backlog off LA in 2020, 2021, and into 2022. But notice here, right around the end of 2022 to the end of 2023, it's reversing. It's actually going back up. Matter of fact, you just saw us go over 50% containers now going back to the West Coast because the ports of LA and Long Beach in particularly are advertising really cheap rates. Well, there's, excuse me, there's cheap Trans-Pacific rates. And then the terminals are advertising really good bon good good incentives to go into the port. Matter of fact, they are reversing a lot of the lessons they had learned during the, sh the shutdown. And one of the things we're seeing is containers sitting in the terminal once again. They really have not learned their lesson. And if you come down here on this chart, really recommend it. I'll have this, this link in the show notes for you. This is the numbers here for September. This is the number of September TEUs coming into the ports. Looks at the top 10 ports. Notice here the subtotal for East Coast, Gulf Coast versus West Coast. You're seeing the West Coast up 16.7%. The uh, East Coast, Gulf Coast down 13.4%. Matter of fact, September numbers are up on the West Coast over the East and Gulf Coast. Not for the three month average, not, not for three months yet but we're starting to see that shift happening. And what that's telling me is that shippers are going to start using that. Now understand, you can't just swing a ship and offload your container where you want. You have to have the land network set up to receive those containers. You need drayage, short, short haul trucking. You may need class one rail. You need warehouses, distribution centers. So one of the things that we saw happen during 2020, 2021 with the supply chain crisis is a lot of shippers, shippers are those who are shipping the boxes, the carriers carry the boxes, those are the shipping lines. It's confusing, I know, but that's the terminology they use. A lot of shippers have diversified. They can now receive boxes, not just on the West Coast, but on the West Coast, East Coast, Gulf Coast. And so that they can kind of swing containers to where they need. And we are seeing that right now. Uh, we're seeing it not just in the container industry, but also in the bulk industry. Uh, great story by Greg Miller just out about how bulk carriers loading grain coming out of the U.S. are going through the Suez Canal vice the Panama Canal. So this is a really significant development that's happening. At the same time, the container liners are starting to feel the downward pressure. This story by Mike Schuller over at G-Captain. Maersk, which is now the third largest shipping line, it's, it's MSC, uh, and then CMA, CGM, and then Maersk. Although Maersk and CMA, CGM are really close. They keep kind of flipping back and forth here. Maersk to reduce headcount by 10,000 amid challenging market conditions. So the parent company of Maersk, AP Moeller Maersk, is announced plans to cut 10,000 employees uh, due to the, the challenging work environment. In their financial results for the third quarter of 2023, Maersk reported revenue of $12.1 billion, a significant decrease from $22.8 billion in the same period last year. Okay, hang on. If you want to really see where Maersk is on this, this number, you got to go back 10 years and look at the fact that in the third quarter, Maersk was making barely profits in many years. So, yes, they're down $10 billion, but I am not going to cry tears for Maersk on this one because they're still making pretty good money at this point. But they do know that they're looking at a downward trend. The company's earnings before interest and taxes, EBIT margin was 4.4%, and that's impacted by the decline in freight rates and volumes. The consolidated, uh, and I forget how they pronounce this acronym, because if I say it, I'm going to get dinged for saying it. I am not a financial guy. Came in at $1.8 billion for the quarter. This is the EBITDA. Uh, that's down more than 80% from $10.8 billion in Q3. So Vincent Clark, the CEO of Maersk, went on to say this, quote, our industry is facing a new normal. With subdued demand, prices back in line with the historical levels, and inflationary pressure on our cost base. Since the summer, we have seen overcapacity across most regions triggering price drops and no noticeable uptick in ship recycling or idling. So that last part is really key because everyone, including myself, I will tell you when I make mistakes, I envisioned the mass scrapping of container vessels in the end of 2022 going to 2023. That has not happened. It's up. We're seeing it go up, 
but nowhere near the scope and scale that we envisioned it happening. And instead, what we're seeing is a lot of container liners are keeping ships going, but they're waiting for new tonnage to come out so they can right size the vessels, get more uh, fuel efficient vessels and vessels that can operate on uh, multiple routes on there before they start getting rid of the vessels. And what they're doing is they're selling these vessels to smaller feeder companies that are operating local uh, practices or local services. And that goes to this story by Bloomberg, Mare slumps after forecasting weak global trade until 2026. This goes hand in hand with that story I just read. But what they're talking about here is that they're predicting a downward trend in trade up until 2026. Uh, Again, if you look at that chart I gave you from the National Retail Federation, we're back to that kind of flat, very slow growth, nowhere near the rapid growth we saw in the 2010s. And I think that's what Maersk is looking at. Plus, not mentioned here, but very important, is that all the companies are looking for their interim fuel source to meet IMO fuel requirements. Uh, Maersk, for example, is adopting green methanol. And so there's a lot of funding that's going into the investment into new fuel production, new fuel on ships, and how those ships operate. Really important to uh, study here to look at. In the meantime, shipping companies like MSC, Mediterranean Shipping Company, Maersk and MSC are in an alliance, what's called the 2M Alliance. That alliance ends in 2025. It is the biggest alliance. Those two firms control about 35% of all the capacity on the ocean. MSC is the largest fleet because MSC bought anything. If you had a container ship, MSC would buy it from you. And the fact is that MSC's vintage fleet holds the key to liner shipping demolition derby. So Sam Chambers over at Splash 24-7 wrote this piece, which I think is really insightful. Uh, one in five of the general container fleet is ripe for demolition and the world's largest liner, MSC, accounting for nearly 25% of all box ships aged 20, or more, 20 years or more, according to a new analysis from Alpha Liner. As such, MSC's decision when to scrap and in what quantity should affect the fortunes of many other lines looking at the overcapacity projections plaguing the container sector for the coming year. MSC bought ships like crazy, and, and they got deals on many of these ships. And they've been running pretty old vessels here. They've installed them with scrubbers so that they can burn dirtier fuel. And they're basically running them until they can't be run anymore. Then they're going to sell them for scrap. So they're going to get the, the, the scrap value for these vessels. And so Maersk is going, I mean, me, uh, MSC will have some revenue coming in from the scrapping. The question is, when they start letting their fleet go, that's going to be the run on scrapping. And this is what Sam is, is envisioning here in this story. So you're looking at, you know, container imports still rising coming into October. Now we're about to see them start to fall. We've got issues with transits through the Panama Canal, which is going to be reshuffling where containers going. You've got the two major shipping companies, Maersk and MSC, two of the largest container operators dealing with the beginning of the downturn. Maersk is laying off company, uh, laying off employees. MSC is poised to scrap their, their vessels. And then you have this element. And so what are the wild card elements? What are the wild card elements that we should be watching out there uh, for the future? And I'll give you a couple. So this one over from Maritime Executive, the ILA, this is the International Longshore Association. These are the union uh, longshore workers on the East and Gulf Coast, but these are specifically the East Coast ones. Uh, ILA leadership warns U.S. East Coast dock workers to prepare for 2024 strike. The leadership of the International Longshore Association, representing dock workers along the East Coast, as far west as Houston and the Great Lakes, is working uh, to harden its membership for a potential strike in October of 2024. Hmm, October 2024. It, I think something happens in November of 2024. I can't remember what it is. Oh, that's right. President Biden is up for re-election. So I wonder what's going to happen then. Uh, goes on here, while the master contract for some 45,000 of the ILA's 70,000 members has 10 months left, union leaders began more than a year in advance to talk about the potential of job action. We were over a year and a half out from when the ILWU, the West Coast labor strike, or labor workers, contract expired. And that was up and down all over the place until they finally, finally came up with an agreement. And I would argue that it was the descent on the West Coast over the ILWU and the, and the, and the, the potential force strike that was one of the big impetuses for a lot of people to shift their containers to come to the East and Gulf Coast, along with the logjam that was associated with the supply chain. 
This right here is going to scare a lot of friggin' people. And the fact that there's a potential for a strike in October of 2024, number one, what you're going to see is a lot of people are going to be pushing freight out early into the first half of 2024 to get to the East and Gulf Coast. So that should a strike happen in October, their freight for the holiday seasons, Christmas, uh, all of them are already in place. That's going to cause a lot of problems. But it goes to a larger issue about U.S. ports. So this story right here also caught my attention. U.S. commits over $500 million to develop Sri Lankan container terminal. U.S. will provide $553 million in financing for a port terminal in Sri Lanka, capital uh, being developed by the Indian billionaire Gautam Adani, as New Delhi and Washington look to curtail China's influence in South Asia. This is coming from the International Development Finance Corporation. So China has been out there through their Belt and Road Initiative, providing money and loans to everybody to build up infrastructure across Asia, Africa, everywhere. And the U.S. has been lagging behind in this. And Sri Lanka is a really interesting place. It is right there astride the supply, the shipping route between the Red Sea and the Straits of Malacca. So, you know, if you sail out of Singapore, heading toward the Suez Canal, you're going to come right by the southern tip of Sri Lanka. And India has like no major ports. It's ridiculous. India doesn't have a major port. Sri Lanka, on the other hand, is a huge ne nexus because at Sri Lanka, container ships can decide whether to continue on to the Persian Gulf, to the Red Sea, or head south toward the Cape, uh, Cape of Good Hope and head toward South America. So it's a really big hub port. And so we're investing $500 million in Sri Lanka, again, building good interest, firming up our position in the Indian Ocean, which is great. Fantastic. You want to counter China, this sounds like a, a, a good deal. However, if you look at U.S. ports, U.S. ports, what's the word I'm going to use here, are, are not efficient. They are not efficient. So this comes from the, uh, this is the global ranking of port indexes. A little hard for you to read, I apologize. But basically, this counts the top 350 ports, I think, around the world, container ports, and ranks them. And what you see here is number one ranked is uh, Changsha, I believe. Uh, no, excuse me, Yangshan. In, uh, in, in uh, China, you get uh, Salada, uh, which is in the Middle East. Basically, a whole series of ports from around the world and almost none in the United States. you got to come over here to number 52, the Port of Virginia, to find the very first U.S. port. And if you proceed through this chart, you come here to the very end, and I'll kind of zoom in here for you so you can see the very end here. This is the very last element so that we see here. And go down to 348. The very last port is the port of Savannah. Above that, Vancouver, Long Beach, uh, jump up ahead here, Oakland at 343, Charleston at 340, go up here a little bit more, 336 is Los Angeles, 335 is Houston. So U.S. ports rank in terms of efficiency toward the bottom. It, it's not measuring capacity. We're not doing capacity. Uh, when I did my review of this year's review of maritime transport, they did a, a study about how long it takes to cycle containers. And the U.S. ports are demonstrably longer. It takes a long time to cycle containers in U.S. ports. That's what's making them inefficient. Plus the technology in the ports to get the containers off the terminals, the automation, the ability for drayage, truck drivers to come in, rail to get it off, just makes it extremely inefficient. Which brings me to this story here. Marad, the Maritime Administration, just awarded $653 million in funding for port improvement projects. Uh, we, in 2023, it's 653 million. In 2022, it was 703 million. In 2021, it was 241 million. That is part of $17 billion dedicated for ports and waterways through President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure law. $17 billion sounds like a lot of money. But in truth, when you take 653 million and divide it up among ports around the United States, that is not much. Matter of fact, when you look into this story a little bit more, one of the things you see here is how much money is going. The Port of Long Beach, for example, right here, uh, was awarded more than $52 million to modernize critical on-rail, uh, on-dock rail capacity. The Husky Terminal at the Port of Tacoma received the biggest award with $54 million. We just gave $500 million to Sri Lanka to modernize their port. Here we're giving the port of LA and the port of Tacoma about 50 million apiece. 
$17 billion in maritime infrastructure out of a $3 trillion bill. That is less than a half a percent is being devoted out of the infrastructure bill to one of the most important infrastructures we have in the United States, and that is ports, and particularly with containers. And I think that is wrong. I'm sorry. I'm just going to tell you right now. But the problem we do have is that ports are private, uh, either either uh, terminals or private uh, corporations. The ports themselves are either owned by municipal, local, or state governments. Uh, they're not federal entities. But we do not have a coherent national port strategy. In many ways, MARAD is awarding those grants based on the applications they receive. If someone sends in a good application, they're going to get money. But there's really no determination from higher up what our strategy should be in awarding this. And the reason I know this is I talked to someone pretty high up at MARAD and they told me this directly, pretty high up. So I know that this is an issue. And what we're seeing right now is we don't seem to be processing the lessons from the supply chain crisis of 2020, 2021, the great toilet paper shortage, uh, very well. And we really need to be doing that so that when we start talking about national maritime strategies and, and, and you know, there's groups working on this right now that are talking about this. MARAD was tasked through the National Defense Authorization uh, to do a maritime strategy. So they got the Center of Naval Analysis working on that. There's a lot of congressional interest in this right now. So a lot of congressmen's offices are involved in this. A lot of people I know are involved in this firsthand, meeting and talking about this. But I think this issue on containers is really important because we saw what happened with these disruptions. And understand, it only takes a little bit of a hiccup in the supply chain to create a backlog. Remember, we have a supply chain. We don't have a supply web. When you have a supply web, you cut one strand of a supply web, it's still it's still a tough structure. It can still take a load. When you break one link in a chain, you're done. It's all broken. And that's what we have. The problem is a supply chain, not a supply web. And we really need to be focusing on that because we don't seem to be devoting that kind of priority to it. And right now where we're seeing really low water levels in the Mississippi, it's getting really hard to get uh, grain and shipments out to the coast to ship overseas with low water in the Panama Canal. Uh, we're seeing shipping really resonate. I think for everyone who's not on the coast, who doesn't see the water on their daily basis, if you're in Pittsburgh or Iowa or, you know, in, in, even in the mountains, the Rocky Mountains, you begin to realize how important global shipping is to you. And that's one of the reasons I do this show. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a big thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How can you support the page? Well, first off, get a bucket of fresh water, head to the Panama Canal and go dump it in there. But if that's too far for you to do, then hey, support the page locally. You can hit the super thanks button down below where you can contribute directly to the page or head on over to Patreon and become a monthly or yearly subscriber. Listen, th there are a lot of pages out there that will tell you they're giving you the the, the breaking news and, and and all this stuff, and you know they they try to get you with uh, a, a lot of flash. And, and you'll notice that this channel does not have a lot of flash. It's me. It, that's it. It's all there is is me. Uh, I try to give you information that I think is pertinent to you in as non biased a way as I can. I've got biases. I, I, I I'm human. I have. I have my biases uh, and they will come out time to time, but I'm always trying to make sure and mitigate them and let you know when I'm giving you my biases. So for example, when I talk about the New York Yankees, I'm biased toward the New York Yankees. Until our next episode, this is Sal, signing off.